next speaker is uh, Michael Eckstein from this is a Barcelona in Krakow. And uh, okay, yeah, he's only in the end exact expansion of Mr. Oh, so it's changed. So only uh, yeah. Okay, anyway, it's Mr. Eckstein. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, and thanks to the organizers for giving me an opportunity to present my results here. So it was supposed to be about the spectral action, but finally it will be mainly about the heat traces. But uh, yeah, I hope to get to the spectral action by the end of the talk so that you don't feel disappointed. And it's a joint work with uh, Arthur Zions, also from Krakow, and uh, it should appear on archive next month. So. Sorry? Maybe. <laughs> All right, so imagine you have a positive operator. Okay, so you have a certain positive operator acting on a separable infinite dimensional Hilbert space. Now I will assume that it has a Tilo kernel. Mm. and uh, with a compact resolvent. So by the spectral theorem, you know that uh, the spectrum of this operator can be arranged in a nice sequence of eigenvalues. Uh, and the sequence is such that uh, The only accumulation point is at infinity. Okay, and well, it also has some multiplicities. So, given that such an operator, you can uh, define many interesting functions, spectral functions. So, two of them, which are, which we will be concerned with in this talk, will be the heat trace. And it's just trace e to the minus p t and the zeta function. So it's p to minus. Okay, so this one is a, a real positive function. This one is a complex function. Okay, and the first natural question is, uh, okay, but when are they actually even defined? So when this operator is trace class, when this operator is trace class? First proposition. Uh, Okay, and let me define another function, which is the, called the spectral growth function, uh, which basically counts the eigenvalues, which are smaller than certain given number lambda, right? And then, and then these are multiplicities of the operator. Okay, so first result is that if, uh, for all epsilon greater than zero, this is O of E to epsilon lambda as lambda goes to infinity. Mm. Then are well defined. Well defined, I mean that this operator is trace class for any t greater than zero, uh, and this function has a non-trivial domain. So there exists at least one complex number s for which this operator is trace class. Let me give you a counter example. Uh, <laughs> No, a counterexample, so a, an operator which is, ah, okay, okay. which for which the heat trace is not well defined, okay. nor the zeta function. Yeah. Uh, okay, so just take an operator which has eigenvalues logarithm of n, for n greater or equal than 2, say. Uh, then for this operator, well, the heat trace will be, well, this operator will be of the trace class for t greater than 1. Uh, and the zeta function has an empty domain. Okay, 
so that's more or less the setting. Okay, and now what we are interested in uh, sorry, uh, so that should be the aim. Asymptotic expansion of trace of p uh, as p goes to zero. Okay, so just a short reminder and a fix the notation. Mm, so I will use this symbol. Uh, Okay, so this means that this function has an asymptotic expansion as p tends to zero. And this is a formal series. It may have zero radius of convergence. Uh, and these guys are for the asymptotic scale. And uh, well, the definition of an asymptotic expansion is that f of p minus rho n of p, uh, that this should be O of rho n plus one of p. Okay, just to remind you. Okay, uh, well, what's the motivation? Well, there are known results of Gilke and then many other people. Um, but okay, stating it generally, if uh, you have a certain pseudo-differential operator uh, on, a, say, compact Riemannian manifold and the vector bundle, E. Uh, so it should be a positive elliptic uh, PDO. Uh, then there exists an asymptotic expansion of the corresponding heat trace. And uh, yeah, it has so two parts. So the first part is uh, a n of p times p to minus b plus n over m. Okay, so d is the dimension of your manifold. M is the order of the operator. Okay, this this is for differential operators. If it's a PDO. Then in general we have a second term which is uh, dk say uh, pk log p. Okay, you have a log term if this is a pseudo differential operator. Uh, sorry, b log 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 log. Sorry, <laughs> log log of p. Okay, so that's what was known. Uh, and of course, this is in classical geometry. And since we want to do non-commutative geometry, uh, we would like to have some general results about arbitrary operators and the associated heat traces. Uh, because, well, as far as I know, there were no general results known in, 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 this, in this domain. And uh, just from one problem to another, you have to dutifully fully prove that there exists an asymptotic expansion of the heat trace for, for non-commutative torus, for instance. So the aim was to get an insight and say, okay, whether I can claim that, okay, for certain classes of the operators, there exists an asymptotic expansion. Mm -hmm. And the second thing was to uh, say something about the convergence about of these expansions. Uh, okay, so. Uh, okay, so the technique I will use is this one. Asymptotic expansion. Okay, so we call the Mellin transform of a positive function. Uh, 
which is defined as an integral f of mt ds minus 1 a and well, of course it's it's a complex function as can be complex and it is defined whenever this integral converges uh, okay and well let me start with the lemma that which holds in this uh, general context of unbounded operators uh, so if your zeta function is holomorphic say for real part of the argument greater than some number in general this is well, it's a generalized Dirichlet series so it will have a not a radius of convergence but a, an FC self convergence so it's holomorphic for for real part of the argument to the right okay mm then uh, Melling transform of the trace of P of S this will be just gamma of S zeta P of S okay well for real part of S greater than L okay so we have this nice correspondence between the two spectral functions so now the idea is to use inverse Mellin transform so given a zeta function we use the inverse Mellin transform to get some information about the heat state okay so just to remind you the formula of the important S e to the power minus S to the okay uh, so it's a vertical uh, complex integral and again well this this C should lie in say the uh, domain of definition of this function so in our case it's uh, in this region of the complex plane and well if if you have this formula for one C then it does not depend on this uh, okay so well if you want to compute such an integral what do you do well you have to close the contour. To close the contour, you need a meromorphic extension of your zeta function to the whole complex plane. Assume you have it. Let's draw a picture. Here is the complex plane, imaginary part, the real part. Uh, okay, and the situation is the following. So we have the, this is a function, you have your say value of L somewhere here. Uh, then you take C wherever you like here. Okay, and then, so here everything is holomorphic and nice. Uh, here are the poles. So first you have the poles of the gamma function. So at 0, minus 1, minus 2, and so on. And then you have the poles of zeta function, which in general can be everywhere. Say here, here, here. Wherever you like. And they can be of uh, 
arbitrary order. I don't assume anything that they're of first order or whatever. Actually, probably one can even tackle the essential singularity. Let's keep simple for the moment. Uh, okay, and you want to compute the integral here. So I need to close the console, and uh, I will do it in a certain step. So uh, first. So I will first close it here. Okay, this I will just call minus L1, minus L2, uh, well, and so on. So the lines are avoiding the post. Yes, the lines should avoid the post. That's true. Uh, okay, if I have this, then I, I make another sequences here. somewhere. They can encompass one pole or whatever number, finite number of poles. Uh, okay, these I will call y1, y, uh, yeah. This will be y minus 1, uh, minus 2, and so. So here in this part I can choose another sequence. Okay, so that's the strategy. I choose well, first I divide it into the strips, and then I choose sequences in this way. Okay, and here's the uh, theorem. Is okay, I will just denote for simplicity. I will write this to be gamma times zeta, right? The theorem says that, okay, so if there exist uh, suitable sequences Rn uh, and uh, which sequence is here k for k in Z this is for all n okay suitable sequences I mean they avoid all of the poles so uh, and uh, let's put a star here uh, basically just one condition on my function the supremum of this zeta function is x plus y and this should go to zero whenever k goes to plus minus infinity so this basically means that the horizontal part of the contour would not contribute to the integral. And then, for any t greater than zero, uh, okay, so you have an asymptotic expansion of your Higgs trace as t goes to zero. So there exists an asymptotic expansion. Uh, Okay, and let me write more or less what kind of form does it have. Okay, so th this is an the asymptotic series, and then the asymptotic scale, which is here, uh, it's of the following form. So you sum over all k's, and then s in s n k. Okay, this s n k uh, just this region. Okay, so this is S11. One, one. Uh, this guy here, so the two of them will be S, uh, uh, what's this? Okay, this would be S21 and so on. Okay, so I just sum over the, and I sum over the residues here. Uh, residues S prime for S of this zeta function s prime t2 minus s prime okay oh, let me put this parenthesis here okay so that's the outcome uh, but uh, let me give a warning here so in general uh, the grouping 
and the order does match. Okay, so it means that the theorem states that there exists sequences uh, such that this condition holds, then I have the asymptotic expansion, but in general, if I would choose another sequences, then I can get something different. So stating it other way, this series here, which is also might be infinite, uh, is in general only conditionally complete. Okay, it's not probably a very common situation in most of the applications we we don't see it. But yeah, so there's one nice way to to avoid it. Uh, yes, I will get, uh, in general, this, I, I wanted to, uh, to get here. So in general, uh, yes, this, this guy can have poles of arbitrary order, okay? And uh, if I have a second order, I will get a log term popping out of this residue, like this is the residue of this. Sorry? Yes, yes, basically if I have uh, first order poles, of zeta times gamma, then I don't have logs. If I have second order, then I will get logs. If I have third order, I will get log squares. Uh, and of course, I can get uh, complex powers here because I can have poles on the outside of the real line. So in general, I will have a p to power i something, so oscillating. In what sense? Oh, in the sense of the definition I gave you there. Yes. So this sum, sum over n is an asymptotic series. And everything what's inside, this is just one term of the asymptotic expansion. And it does form an asymptotic scale in the sense of definition. Okay, so let me just give you well, one nice condition. So if you replace the star by something uh, Uh, oh, okay, maybe just to make it shorter. <laughs> if I put a sum over k here, then I get the absolute convergence of this. Okay, so that's also a nice condition to, which can quite easily be checked when uh, you have your zeta function. But still the grouping my, might play a role. In general it won't, but one has to be cautious. Okay, and what's another nice thing about this formulation that, okay, uh, is uh, that we can almost on the nose get information about the convergence of the asymptotic series. Uh, okay, so let me first put some definitions. Okay, maybe let's, let's just state it. So, uh, I have a series over n, which is an asymptotic series. It, in general, it won't converge for any t, but it might converge. If it converges, then it might converge to this function, or it might converge to some function which is slightly different than this one. So if this series converges and converges to this guy, then I will say that I have an exact expansion of the heat space for some values of t. If this converges but to heat space plus something tiny, then I will say that it's almost exact. Okay, and uh, let me give you a, a result. Let's state it as a theorem. Uh, okay, so if for all n, okay, if, if the assumptions of the theorem holds, yeah, and for all uh, n in n and for all y in r, uh, I can get the following bound, t minus r n plus r y should be smaller than some constant, which is t minus epsilon n y. Uh, and uh, well, the sequence this sequence is bounded, uh, then 
in okay, so my heap trace C uh, is exact. So the asymptotic series actually converges for T in zero big T and this large T uh, can be expressed as a limb soup sentence to infinity of this sequence Rn Tn over Xi. Okay, so of course it's only a sufficient condition. I don't claim that there are no convergent expansion outside of this one, but still it gives you a quite a nice formula which can be tested in several cases. Uh, well, again, let me stress that uh, even if I get an exact expansion, again, the series over n, which is now convergent, in general will be conditionally convergent. So I need to assume a bit more to get the absolute convergence. Okay. Uh, well I won't write the equation, but just to say that in general, I might have a series which is uh, exact uh, with some range of parameters and then I can have uh, can have it to be say I will call it absolutely exact for some other range of parameters for some smaller t right okay and mm-hmm uh I will come to an example shortly. But <laughs> yeah, okay, so uh, all of these things about conditional convergence and so on, that well, they don't appear, well, they, they don't pop out in the in classical case, and even for quantum groups, we don't see anything like that. But uh, yeah, but still one has to, one has to be careful. Yeah, well, I have a meromorphic function. Yeah, I assume that, yeah, that's that's an important assumption that the zeta function has a meromorphic extension to the whole complex. I hope to give you an example when it actually fails. Uh, okay, so. Just one thing, because I told you that we can have an exact expansion, but we can also have an almost exact expansion. So I don't have any nice condition uh, similar to this one, but, uh, but I have another proposition, which is kind of obvious. Uh, if the set of poles of ZT is finite, then heat trace of C mm, is almost exact, but not exact for all T greater than zero. Okay, let me stress that you, you should have the poles of this z function here, which basically means if your gamma function uh, will have the poles here, zero, minus one, minus two, and so on. So if I want this set to be finite, I need my zeta function to be such that it cancels the poles of gamma. So it's not a very common situation. But still, if I have it, and I will show you an example, then my heat trace is almost exact. Well, that's more or less obvious because the asymptotic series is finite. And as it is finite, if you look at the asymptotic as t goes to infinity, on the other hand, you immediately see that it cannot be the whole heat trace, so there should be some reminder. And that's why it's almost exact, but not exact. 
Mm. Okay, so, so two examples. So let's first uh, uh, two point one say consider the following operator. Uh, we'll have the eigenvalues of p given by a polynomial and the multiplicities given by another polynomial, uh, say b of n, okay, a b polynomials. Then there's, well, there's a nice result by uh, Matsumoto and Zeng, with some number theory guys. Two thousand and two, I think. Okay, well, they investigated precisely this kind of zeta functions associated with two polynomials. So first of all, that well, this is okay. This is meromorphic. Uh, okay, this is holomorphic. For real part of the argument greater than one plus degree of b over the degree of a, it has a meromorphic continuation. Meromorphic on c, poles of this uh, zeta function, poles of Zeta function mm. are in the following subset. So we have the degree of A here, 1 plus degree of N, uh, degree of B, minus natural numbers, and but not at the minus natural numbers itself. Well, and there are some suitable bounds suitable bounds on verticals. Okay, so that the theorem applies. Okay, so well, we can use our theorem here. And uh, okay, so let me just go to this situation. Now this is relatively simple. Says okay, I will have the poles of gamma function, they are still here. And then the zeta function mm, will give me the poles which might be here, 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 but only on the ring line. And, uh, and they miss the poles of the gamma function, which basically means that mm, right here, so there exists, okay, let me abbreviate, there exists an asymptotic expansion of this heat trace and, uh, well, no log terms and no oscillating terms. Okay, so is this class of operators of any use? Well, it is for spheres, precisely for the spheres. So, well, maybe I can use it here. So, uh, okay. Well, then, of course, you can, if you have the bounds, then you can, you can check the convergence of the asymptotic spheres and so on. And for the case of the spheres, uh, let me write it as a corollary. Mm, you have three instances. So, first, okay, assume you have your Dirac operator on a n-dimensional sphere, uh, which precisely falls into, into this class. Then you first consider the heat trace. Oh, we need a positive operator, so I need to take module, modulus of B. Well, that's pseudo differential, but doesn't matter. So this guy is absolutely exact. So has an absolutely exact expansion. Okay, has 
goes to the exact expansion for t in 0 to pi. Okay, so this is really an, an exact expansion. And now, well, I have taken the modulus of d, but of course I can take something else. For instance, I can take the heat trace associated with d square, which doesn't seem to make much difference, but it turns out that this guy uh, has an almost exact, but not exact, expansion for all t greater than zero if uh, well maybe here mm, okay that's not convenient on odd dimensional spheres okay uh, the absolutely exact I uh, assume that that the, the asymptotic series is actually absolutely convergent, not only convergent. So that's more or less this uh, this thing plus some more refined condition. Okay, but surprisingly enough, if you take the same kind of heat trace, but on even dimensional spheres, uh, then it's divergent. The asymptotic series has zero radius of convergence. Divergent expansion. Okay, so well, I find this result somewhat surprising because I think if you look at it from say classical point of view, uh, this one is a very nice differential operator, whereas this one is only a pseudo differential. So generally you would suspect that this thing would be behaving worse than this one, but it turns out not to be the case. And there's a difference between the odd and even dimensional spheres, which is quite, quite striking. Exact means that I have an equality for some range of parameters of, sorry? Absolutely convergent on the right hand side for some range of parameters. Uh, no, no, it has nothing to do with the grouping. It's just that, uh, well, you, you have a different zeta function. In this case, you have a, uh, say, imagine you're on S1, okay? In this case, you will have a, uh, well, it's a very simple Riemann zeta function. Uh, but in this case, say, on S1, you will have zeta r of 2s, double r. Yeah, well, uh, here I, I look at it from a purely algebraic point of view. And, uh, well, and that's basically the only information you have, that the zeta function here is just the Riemann zeta function, and here is the Riemann zeta function for doubled arguments. And here, mm, say for S2, you will have the Riemann zeta function uh, on the modified argument. So, okay, I can show you on the... picture here. Okay, so the point is the following. Uh, so first thing that, well, the asymptotic behavior of this zeta functions so for such constants turns out to make a difference if you put two here or not, which makes that this one is absolutely exact and uh, the other one is in generally divergent. But in the case of odd spheres, what happens actually 
is that the poles of the zeta function cancel the poles of the gamma function. So that you're in this, in the case of this proposition. So you will have only a finite number of poles. And that's, that's precisely what's happening. So you have an almost exact expansion. Uh, okay, so let me move uh, to an even more interesting example. Okay, so 3.2. Imagine the following operator. The eigenvalues uh, are exponential, so q to minus n for some u of u to 1, just to make a correspondence with the quantum thing. Well, and then the multiplicities, I just assume that they are polynomial. Okay, so uh, in this case, well, the zeta function is extremely simple. I mean, it's if you write it, a n u two uh, a n s, right? Which is just a geometric series, so you can just sum it, and you you will get the, the function. So uh, where are the poles here? Okay, <laughs> but there are also others. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, well, yeah. Apart from myself, you have the poles of the gamma function, which are still here. And then you have the poles of the zeta function, which are okay. So there will be one at zero, which will add up with this one, and there will be poles. And basically, the order of these poles uh, depend on, the, well, it's just proportional to the order of this polynomial. Okay, so well, proposition. <coughs> we got, well, just apply the, the whole machinery. And what you get is that the heat trace associated with such operators is actually absolutely exact for all t greater than zero. Okay, so you can get a interesting formula which, which gives you everything. Whereas if you look at the heat trace, well, you write it as a, just as a series, then it's some doubly exponential sum and you don't really know what to do with it. But applying this Merlin inverse uh, transform technique, you can get a an exact formula valid for every t greater than zero. And in this formula, you will get, well, I don't want to write it, but just but the leading term. Leading term will be in uh, log t degree of a. So even if you don't have uh, multiplicities at all, you will still have a log term here because the pole of the zeta function will somehow merge with the pole of the gamma function. 
and because of these complex parts here, you will get oscillating currents. Okay, and well, that's for the first time we discovered it for the case of the pod list here. Uh, yeah, but but it seems to be a more general situation and. Probably, well, I can apply this machinery to fractals, for instance, yeah. So that's, that's the general picture. Uh, okay, so uh, let me now give you a, well, so maybe not a counter example, but something which is about the limits of the method. So you might think that, okay, if I take a operator with uh, exponential growing eigenvalues and everything converges, that's nice. So what happens if I take something which grows even faster? <coughs> Why not? So imagine the following operator. Uh, let's take E for simplicity. K to N square, well, why not? And no multi multiplicity, just for simplicity. So What's the zeta function in this case? <coughs> e to minus s n square. And this is a Jacobi zeta function. <coughs> hmm? uh, yeah, well, okay. <coughs> yeah, well, okay. If you want the exact formula, then it's uh, using this notation, it will be one half theta three. I think it's called. Uh, there's an additional parameter which is zero in our case, and here I have minus s plus one. Okay. Generally, it can be expressed in terms of Jacobi zeta function. But this guy is known to have a boundary of analyticity. Boundary. CT, sorry, <laughs> uh, at real part of S equals zero. So it's holomorphic in the right hand side of the complex plane, but it cannot be continued to the left side at all, which means that basically you don't, cannot apply the theorem, you cannot have a meromorphic extension, nothing. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's, it is a general situation, so proposition. Uh, okay, I have to assume, let T be such that. I have to assume something about its multiplicity, so I just assume mild condition that they grow, say, in a power law, so as n tends to infinity for some. B in R plus. Okay, and uh, so now if uh, the limit as n tends to infinity of log J lambda n plus 1 over lambda n, if this tends to infinity, then it's infinity plus infinity. Uh, then we're in this situation always. So zeta p is holomorphic for real part of s greater than zero. So this is important because it tells you that the heat rate and the zeta functions are well defined uh, in this sense that they are just well defined, but just that you cannot continue it meromorphically, so, but uh, uh, it has a boundary of analyticity. Uh, okay, let me call it boundary of analyticity. <laughs> uh, okay, and this line, real part of S equals zero. So 
So this is, yeah, it's, this was also quite kind of su surprise to, to have something which grows exponentially, then everything converges and does it really well. And if you take something which is just slightly faster than an exponential, then everything just collapses. You cannot say anything. Uh, okay, since I have uh, 10 minutes, let me, so I promised you the spectral action, so let me tell you something about the spectral action of the librarian. <laughs> so in general, you probably all know this theorem of Kamsadin and Kohn, which says that, okay, whenever I have a, an expansion of the heat space, I can have a corresponding as asymptotic expansion of the spectral action. Just that in this theorem, uh, they had to assume, well, first thing was to assume that uh, simple dimension spectrum, which basically means uh, only simple first order poles of the zeta function. Uh, and secondly, actually it's not stated explicitly, but uh, you really have to assume, well, you know, at least in their version that uh, there are no poles of the zeta function outside of the real line. Well, at least my impression was that if, if you don't assume it, then, well, you basically have to refine a little bit the proof. Of course, it can be done, but. Yes, no. Okay, and the third thing is that, uh, well, you know in the spectral action there's a cutoff function at play and you want to have some knowledge what kind of this, what kind of function can you take for cutoff function so that it works actually. Oh, and finally, uh, you would like to know if, if there exists an exact expansion of the uh, spectral action that would be, that would be really nice. Okay, so uh, let me detour before going to spectral action. Uh, okay, so the spectral action is this. So you take this kind of functional, it, you take its trace. Well, you assume that this function is nice so that this operator is trace plus, and then you seek for sig. Sorry? Uh, well, okay, I will take absolute value. Uh, you can, yeah, that's. You can state it on, on it. Yeah, but okay, in general, I will take the absolute value. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it, yeah, it, I, I prefer to stay with the modulus of d instead of d squared. That's, that's one thing. Uh, all right, so okay, let me first define a, a class of functions. So, well, I have a my Laplace transform and uh, okay, I have F to be a Laplace transform of D phi. Uh, D phi is a positive finite mm, Borel measure. important to stick to measures because, uh, for instance, it can have a measure uh, or a support of, uh, of measure zero, which allows me to include the heat trace section here in this, in this class. And well, then it's, uh, it's just a technical assumption. So I, I define my class of quitable cutoff functions depending on some parameter p, which will turn out to be the p summability of your spectral tuple. So f which is a Laplace transform of a suitable positive finite Borel measure. And it should satisfy two more things. So mm, should be integrable at zero uh, with s to power minus p. And uh, well, it should decay rather fast. So it means that for all n, I should have uh, zero s n d phi of s. Okay, so it decays fast at infinity. A uh, few examples. So 
So first thing, uh, or any function which is of this form, can take a polynomial here, e2 minus a x. Uh, well, it is in this class, so f is in Pp, sorry, for all Pp. Greater or, yeah, greater or equal. Uh, so that's that's the definition because well, the, the corresponding measure will be indeed some kind of well, Dirac distribution. So uh, so I have the heat kernel uh, case in the class of the cutoff functions, which is something we would like to have. Well, secondly, you can take uh, anything or well, any positive finite measure with compact supports, and of course this will be satisfied. Mm, so, compact support of P phi. Uh, well, another thing that you can take uh, x plus a power minus r, uh, and uh, and then it will be in P p, but for all p smaller than r, right? So, well, you have examples of nice cutoff functions. Uh, well, and the theorem is that, okay, so if I have a, mm, okay, so let uh, B, all the, oh, I said it for the Dirac operator, E B such that P trace, say, Corresponding to modulus of B, or has a as a, an asymptotic expansion. Expansion. Uh, uh, then, mm, oh, okay. Uh, just assume that I'm on a p-subable spectral trip. Then, for any, for all f in p, say r. with r large enough, greater than the p summability of the spectral triple, uh, then there exists uh, an asymptotic expansion of this uh, b modulus of b of lambda as lambda tends to infinity. Okay, and basically it is expressed using the term, using the, using the, the expansion of the heat trip. Uh, Okay, so well, if I, my time is coming to the end, let me just stress that in general, in this expansion, you will have the logarithmic terms, you will have the oscillating terms as well, uh, and it it depends on the analytic structure, monomorphic structure of your of your zeta function at hand. Uh, and uh, let me also stress that this cutoff function will, in general, enter in a much more involved way in this formula. In the in the simple example of Chamsudinian cone, it's entered only through its moments and then value zero. But here it won't be the case; it would be much more difficult. One can get uh, exact formulas, but it's uh, okay. And to conclude, uh, interesting. So imagine I have a. Um, Absolutely exact expansion on, say, zero big T, uh, and then I take then mm, for any function, say in C P again, this C P should be well C R with blah blah blah. Uh, yeah, actually, well. Let me even write it in this way. So, f, which is a Laplace transform of a measure, and uh, d phi, uh, or support of d phi, this measure is included in say, 0, say, m. Uh, so, this thing, my spectral, fun spectral action, mm, okay, so this asymptotic series. Uh, is actually convergent, so it's say in this 
sense is absolutely exact exact and here's a surprise for lambda uh, which is greater than m over t so in general you will have something which is convergent for large energies and it becomes asymptotic for low energies let me conclude with this puzzle. <laughs> Well, in a sense, yes, because uh, well, what I used really from the say, number theory, I told you that it's number theory, but actually these guys just investigated zeta functions. Well, and their motivation came from number theory, but as long as you have the zeta function, then you have everything, because then, well, uh, of course, in the classical case, this coefficients of the heat trace expansion have a nice geometric interpretation in terms of some integrals for a manifold. Well, here you still have, uh, say, some local expressions in the sense that they are residues of zeta functions or more generally the coefficients of the Laurent expansion of the, of the zeta function. Whether this is geometric or not, that's, <laughs> that's another story. But well, in, in the sense, it is a generalization of the C rate with coefficients to something geometric. As long as you have the zeta function, you have all of the information. I have a question. So the limit for the monomer is going to be quite high. So it's not much going to cause a problem if the monomer is going to be quite high. Yeah. So that's my question. But you could ask the question, do they exist for such bounds that the bounds of the set are convergent? Uh, <laughs> Yeah. And uh, in, in the present case, it is known uh, that the, the best we found are wrong. And in the present case, it is going to be improved. I don't know if you have also mentioned in the previous experiment mm -hmm. the boundary between uh, different values in the same system. So mm -hmm. it could be enlarged in the time of those conditions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That might be an interesting point. Okay.